Good morning, YouTubers. You're watching The Bearded Nerd, and today I'm going to discuss the three games that Howard Scott Warshaw programmed for the Atari 2600 console. Those three games are Yars Revenge, Raiders of the Lost Ark, based on the 1981 blockbuster film from Steven Spielberg and George Lucas, and another game based on one of Steven Spielberg's movies, but I think I'll leave this third one for last. Let's just say it's not one I'm looking forward to. So who is Howard Scott Warshaw? Well, as Warshaw himself put it, he is Colorado-born, Jersey-raised, and New Orleans schooled. Warshaw attended Tulane University, double majoring in math and economics. After receiving his bachelor's degree, he completed his master's degree in computer engineering and began work in 1979 as a multi-terminal systems engineer at Hewlett-Packard. In 1981, Warshaw started working for Atari making video games. His first game was Yar's Revenge. In the game, you control an insect named Yar, who is trying to destroy the evil Poidal by shooting or nibbling your way through a barrier. The game actually had an Easter egg that was Warshaw's initials, HSW. After Yar's Revenge was released in May of 82, it was a huge success for Atari. Now, hold on a minute. You know, I could sit here and narrate an entire segment of Yar's Revenge and its origins, its legacy, etc. How about, instead of me telling the story, we ask the man who created the game himself, Howard Scott Warshaw. How do we do this, you may ask? Well, in the process of making this video, I asked him for an interview, and guess what? He gave one. Well, the title for Yar's Revenge is a great story. Because it's a story, because, you know, I, I had a master's in computer engineering. But before that, I had a bachelor's in economics and math. And I had much more of a business sense than did many of the programmers there. So I sort of pulled my own little marketing thing because what I decided was, you know, once Yars started to shape up to be a pretty good game, and it wasn't Yars yet, it was just the game. And once that looked like a good game, I really wanted my first game to be a game of note, a significant thing. I wanted everything about it to be cool and the best it could be. And when they started coming up with potential names for it, they were all extremely lame, and I didn't really care for the marketing plan. It didn't sound very interesting to me. So I found out, I asked if I could make a submission and do something like that, and I found out, yes, I could. But there was running out of time. So I sat down, I started to think, okay, what do I want to call it? How do I want to name the game? And I tried to make up names, because I was very excited about this. Right? I was very excited about this, because this was an opportunity for me to add a word to the English language, which was something I always wanted to do. And if I could come up with a name for what this character was, and if the game became very popular, you know, then the name of that character would just become, you know, a common word, like Pac-Man, right? So I started to think and make up something. I couldn't really think of anything that sounded interesting to me. So then I thought, if I can't just come up with something, blindly make it up, let me think of uh, an algorithm. Right, some method for naming it. And then I started to think, well, you know, Ray Kazar, who was the CEO of Atari at the time, well, Ray spelled backwards as Yar, and that sounds kind of cool. And Kazar spelled backwards as Razak, and I started to think, okay, well, I don't know what Razak is. And then I started to think, you know, what would make a, the name even stronger would be to have a story to go with it, because nobody had really done a backstory for a game. And so I thought, well, why don't I just make up a whole story behind what the scenario of the game is, and that'll enhance the name. That was all just something to make it stronger to get the name in. And so I wrote. I stayed all night, and I wrote up like a seven or eight page, like sci-fi story about the scenario of how you know Yars came to be, and they were just Earth flies that had mutated through space radiation and turned into these monsters, and then took over their own solar system and. Then there's some other monster that came to get them, you know, and that's the co-tile. And so this whole story that created the scenario for all the characters. And so I submitted that. So what I what I did was I, I gave the submission to the product manager. I said, hey, I got his name, and here's a story, too. I got a story to go with. He goes, oh, okay, well, that's interesting, you know. And I said, okay, so go put this in, and he put it in. And the next day he comes around, and he says, uh, I said, so is this it in? Is it in for consideration? And he goes, yeah. And I said, okay, have they decided yet? And he goes, no. And I said, look, I said, uh, I said, I'd like to tell you a story. I said, I'm going to tell you a little secret, but I don't want this to impact the, uh, 
you know, this election process. You know, I want that to be fair. And he goes, he goes, yeah, okay. I said, so I said, if I tell you a secret, you swear to keep it to yourself, you know, not share it. He's like, yeah. And so I said, okay. So I said, you know, in the Yar, the Yar's game, you know, it's uh, Yar. What's that spelled backwards? And he thinks of everything. He goes, uh, Ray. And I go, right, yeah, and it's in the Razak solar system, right? Razak. You know what that is backwards? He thinks about it, he goes, oh, Kazar. He goes, oh, Ray Kazar, Ray Kazar. He goes, you mean this from Ray Kazar? I said, yeah, yeah, I did. I said, but that's why I don't want anybody to know that. He goes, does Ray know about this? And I said, well, of course Ray knows about this. But it wouldn't be something like this without Ray's knowledge. I said, but that's why I don't want it to be unfair. I don't want it to, it was a prophecy. He goes, oh, oh, okay. And so I said, so you swear you won't tell anybody? He goes, yes. He goes, I promise, absolutely. Okay, so he took off. And at that point, I knew I knew a few things, right? One, I knew he would run right back and tell everybody in marketing, right? <laughs> Two, I knew that nobody in marketing would have the balls to go and actually talk to Ray about it. And three, I knew that was a really good thing because Ray knew nothing about this, right? <laughs> I just made all this shit up. So the next day he comes, he goes, hey, Howard, guess what? I go, what? He goes, we're going to go with, with Yard's Revenge. We're going to go with Yard. I said, oh, that's great. That's great. That's fantastic. And I thought it worked exactly like I planned it. He goes, in fact, he goes, we're going to make a comic book to pack out with the game that's like about the storyline. And I said, well, there you go. That's kind of Because that was, you know, Yard's Revenge was the first game, there was a lot of firsts in Yard's Revenge. But what it was, it was the first game with a backstory. It was the first game with ancillary story and equipment and stuff like that. You know, it had a comic book and all this other stuff. It also was the first game to have credit. Right? It was the first Atari game to go out with credit. Because it had the comic book and had this other stuff, they decided, okay, well, it would be time to give credits and stuff. And then they showed me the credit list, and I noticed that they had credited me with the, doing the game, but they credited someone else with writing the comic book, and I had written the story. And I said, then why didn't I get credit for the story also? And they said, look, Howard, <laughs> you can only have one credit. Would you rather have credit for the story, or would you rather have credit for the game? And I said, I said, well, I will take credit for the game. That's okay. And that was, that was fine. But it was just fine. It's just the kind of stuff that uh, went on. So that's how Yar's Revenge got its name. How did Ray Kazar actually feel about that whole backstory? Did, was he flattered by it? Well, he ultimately did hear about it. I wasn't in touch with Ray all the time, of course. But uh, there was, a month later, there was, uh, there was a press event where we were demoing games for the press, and I was there, and Ray was there, and I was demoing Yard's Revenge on this giant big screen TV when big screen TVs were brand new. You know, you had the projection TVs. And uh, so that was pretty cool. That was the biggest TV I ever played Yard's on. And uh, I sit there playing the game, and Ray comes up, and uh, he looks at me, and he goes, I heard what you did about the name for this game, Howard. <laughs> I said, oh, I said, yeah. I said, well, uh, I said, what'd you think about that, right? As, uh, he goes, just keep making games, Howard. You know, you just keep making games. <laughs> it was kind of an interesting moment with Ray. Ray was an interesting guy. The game was well received by fans, and even to this day, many consider it one of their favorite for the system. This success led to Warshaw being tapped for another game, this time based on the hit 1981 movie Raiders of the Lost Ark. The movie itself rose to be the highest grossing film of all time, thanks in part to having been written by George Lucas, directed by Steven Spielberg, and starring Harrison Ford. This title of highest grossing film would only last about a year, that is, until Spielberg's next film would overtake it. The game Raiders of the Lost Ark is faithful to the movie, in that you control Indiana Jones as he is looking for the Ark of the Covenant. For inspiration while designing the game, Warshaw would walk around the offices at Atari wearing a fedora and cracking a bullwhip. It is said he used to sneak up behind co-workers and crack that whip. Well, Yars had come out, and Yars was a big success. And so I, Yars positioned me as one of the key players at Atari, right? You know, when Yars came out, because Yars was also the most tested game in history, <laughs> in the history of Atari, certainly. 
I mean, because there was some of the Ataris who kind of wanted to kill Yars for whatever reason. They kept asking for task after task and saying, because they said there's a problem with it and we have issues with the game and there's a problem with the game. And, you know, most people didn't really see a problem with the game and most of the people in management never played the game. They didn't do anything with the games, right? They were just managing. So, you know, they didn't really have any sense of game. So someone would tell them, oh, well, there's an issue. There's a problem. Oh, well, what are we going to do? So they would test it. So Yards Revenge became the most tested game in history. And it also, by the end when the smoke cleared, it set records in all the testing. The final test they went through was a play test where you have 100 people come in and they play a, they play the, the target game and they play a control game. And they rate both of them, right? And the, so they did one of these play tests on Yards Revenge and the control game, the, the test game they wanted to test it against, was Missile Command for the 2600. I thought, holy shit, <laughs> they're trying to kill the game, right? Because they're putting this up against the best game on the 2600 at the time. And, but by the end of the, the weekend, Yars Revenge beat Missile Command in the, in the play test. It actually tested hotter than the number one game on the system, okay? So at that point, they got rid of the person who was trying to kill the game. <laughs> They released the game. But by the end of that, I had it, it had basically earned me the reputation of someone who's uh, obviously a serious contender in terms of people who can make good games on 2600. So then when it came up with the opportunity for, you know, we got the rights to do Raiders of the Lost Ark with Spielberg, um, who are we going to get to do it? So they came to me and they said, you know, well, you want to do Raiders of the Lost Ark? And I said, well, sure, that'd be kind of fun. And and they said, okay, well, Spielberg has to approve the programmer for that. So I had to fly to L.A. and do an interview with Spielberg to see if he felt I was a person who should do his game. And we had a really interesting time together. And uh, by the end of it, I had called him an alien. And he, uh, and he decided I was the one who should do the game. So then I did rate it. Upon release in November of 82, the game did have some critics who said the graphics were just average and the sound effects and music were, in their words, non-existent. However, most felt the game was original in its design and gameplay. Overall, it was well received and like Yard's Revenge, Raiders of the Lost Ark is considered to be one of Atari's finer games. This leads me to Warshaw's third game for Atari. And as Warshaw himself even put it, one of my games is in the New York Museum of Modern Art, and another one of my games is the subflooring of the New Mexico desert. Well, guess which one E.T. is. Warshaw's success with both the Yars Revenge and Raiders of the Lost Ark games didn't go unnoticed. And when Atari was asked to make a game based on Steven Spielberg's 1982 film, Warshaw was tapped for the project. Well, nobody said anything, but I had told when I was finishing up Raiders, I was in negotiations with one of the VPs there who was kind of a doofus. <laughs> he was trying to push me with stuff and do things around, and I just looked and I said, well, I said, I'm just finishing off Raiders now, and I know you guys are going to want me to do E.T. next. So, you know, let's just look at it from that point of view. <laughs> See what's up. And he looked at me, he was like a little surprised, you know, that I saw that. And I hadn't heard anything or knew anything, but I mean, of course, you know, it's like, you know, Raiders is a big movie, and E.T. is now the big movie that Spielberg put out. And if they had a movie game for one, of course, they want to do a game for the next. And odds are, they'll want me to do it. <laughs> so, it's like, okay. The movie E.T. surpassed Spielberg's previous film for title of highest grossing film, and would keep that title for 11 years before, yet again, another Spielberg movie would take that title. Negotiations for securing the rights to even make the game only ended in July of 82. The game itself was scheduled for release during the Christmas season later that year. To accomplish this Christmas 82 deadline, this meant the game had to be 100% completed by September 1st. This only gave Warshaw five weeks to make the game. Wait, what? Five weeks? If that doesn't sound like a lot of time to design and develop a game, it's because it wasn't! The average time span it took to even develop a game for Atari back then was six to seven months. But both Atari and Spielberg himself had confidence that Warshaw could develop a game in that amount of time. And then when it turned out 
that there was only five weeks available to do the game and that Spielberg had requested I do the game personally, then, uh, you know, that got to be a whole other story. Did you ever feel like you were in over your head during those five weeks? Not once. Not once. Never even occurred to me. Uh, there was a reason why the release date was September 1st. That was because you know, that's all backtracking from manufacturing to be able to make it for the Christmas market, which was the number one thing. So trying to tell them to delay it was like saying, why don't we just miss some of the Christmas market? And their feeling was if they couldn't release it until like late December, there's no point in doing the game. Because, you know, their feeling is you have to strike with these things when they're hot. And this was it. This was the window. There was five weeks to do the game. That's all there was. I never once thought, oh, I can't do it. I totally had 100% confidence I could do it. This decision to rush development led to some serious issues with the game itself. For starters, Atari skipped audience testing the game. Warshaw did meet with Spielberg to discuss the design and structure of the game, which was divided into four ways. World, Objective, Path to Achieve the Objective, and Obstacles. For the game's setting, Warshaw envisioned a three-dimensional world in the shape of a cube, with E.T. trying to phone home as the main objective. The original plot was for having the player play as E.T. while finding and assembling a phone, then going to a special location to use it to call his ship. The enemies of the game would be characters from the movie, such as Keys, other scientists, and the FBI, who are all trying to capture E.T. Pits were devised as a means to hide the phone parts that E.T. would have to find. After Atari and Warshaw presented this design to Spielberg, it was reported he did not seem enthusiastic and requested a plot much more along the lines of Pac-Man. Wanting to capture the sentimentality he saw in the film, Warshaw proceeded with his originally proposed design for the game. In my interview, Warshaw described Spielberg's involvement with either the Raiders game or the E.T. game as something like this. I don't think Spielberg ever played the game. Spielberg didn't have a lot to do with the games that I made from his movie. What would happen is occasionally he would come up to Sunnyvale and uh, we would have lunch together and we would chat and I'd show him a little bit of this and that with the game. He really didn't have much to do with the games at all. He was a pretty busy dude. I, you know, he made over a million dollars a day through 1982. That was a good year for him. But occasionally he would come by and we would chat and stuff. But what did happen was at the end of, when, when I was finished with Raiders, and this was like in June in 82, and we were coming up to this, you know, back then there was the Consumer Electronics Show. They didn't have, you know, E3, right? There was the Consumer Electronics Show, and that's where all the video game stuff was. And the Consumer Electronics Show back then was like twice a year. And it was in January in Vegas, and it was in June in Chicago. Okay, so we were coming up to this to that CES, and they wanted. So we what we did was, I went to a studio. I went to a film studio, and what we did was we made a video of me playing through the game. So I made a video of a, a playthrough of Raiders Lost Ark, where I sat down, played, and narrated the game. And it was probably the only time we did it in one take. It was probably the only time ever that I played perfectly right through the game and narrated the whole thing along the way. It was just amazing. I don't think I could ever have done that again. But it just was magical. It just worked. So I did this whole thing, a playthrough. I played through the full game perfectly all the way through, finished the game. And to actually play the whole game and just run through and do all that takes about 12 or 14 minutes. That's all it takes, just run through Raiders. <laughs> Especially if you know how to, how to do everything. <laughs> right. You know, that helps. And so, right, because in a venture game, it's about learning how to play the game, not just running through the game. So, so I got that together, got this videotape together, and I like practically handcuffed the videotape to my arm because I wanted to show this to Spielberg. So we got to Chicago, and I'm running around the tape, and eventually he shows up at the Atari booth, and here we are. So we go upstairs in the special room, and we plug it in, and I play the tape room, and he just watches the tape. Now, I am a huge movie fan. So for me to hang with Spielberg in the first place is like an amazing opportunity. I'm super psyched right, to be dealing with him anyway. And now he's watching through the whole thing, and he's not doing anything. He's just sitting there watching. No reaction, no response. And then at the end of it, when it's over, he looks at me and he goes, 
it's just like a movie. And I felt so good. That was one of the amazing moments of my life, is that I did the game for Spielberg's movie, and then I show Spielberg a videotape of a playthrough of the game, and he thinks it's just like a movie. And I just thought, yeah, I did it. Because that was a tremendous feeling of accomplishment, that, 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 that I was right on target with what I had there. And so that was very cool. Like Warshaw mentioned earlier, one of his games is actually in the New York Museum of Modern Art. In 2013, Yars Revenge was selected alongside a number of other games, such as Pac-Man, Space Invaders, and Pong, under the exhibition titled Applied Design. As for E.T., well, the story doesn't end well. While the game did sell 1.5 million units, it also left an estimated 3 million units unsold. Plus, there were a number of consumers who returned their cartridges. In the end, Atari ended up receiving around 4 million unsold cartridges from retailers. Not sure what to do with this excess inventory, they began to look for viable options. Ultimately, they opted for dumping all the unsold ET cartridges, as well as other excess inventory, in a landfill in New Mexico. For years, this story just served as an urban legend. However, in 2014, an excavation began and eventually uncovered about 1,300 cartridges of various Atari games, which did include E.T. Many of the uncovered games were auctioned off for charity, while the rest are preserved for a museum that will commemorate the burial. To learn more about the 2014 dig, check out the documentary film Atari Game Over, which also features Howard Scott Warshaw. Almost 35 years later, we are still discussing this game. Is it the worst game of all time? Doubtful. I mean, there was a number of worse games than E.T. But perhaps it was the impact E.T. left on both our memories and the gaming market at the time. E.T. is very significant in several ways. One is that of all the 2,600 games there were, E.T. is really the only one people still talk about, right? So I did a game in five weeks in like 8K of code that if you look at, you know, because I always looked at games as a broadcast medium, okay? It's not just technology. It's a broadcast medium. And, you know, what's the point of media? You know, you're a writer, right? You understand media, right? And yes. you understand, yeah. the uh, to me, the idea of producing media is to generate interest and social discourse and consideration, right? I mean, a good piece of media entertains people. A great piece of media gets people to think and entertains them, right? Right. So when you write an article, hopefully people are going to read it and they're going to really discuss it or they're going to go on about it. They're gonna, it's going to generate social discourse, right? So 30 years after this machine is dead, a game that I did is still generating focus, interest, and social discourse. We're talking about it now, right? So that's a very powerful thing to do. In my opinion. The other great legacy for me, the thing is, is like E.T., you know, people ask me, you know, does it bother you if E.T. is the worst game of all time? And I, I tell them quite honestly, I say, not only doesn't it bother me, I actually prefer that it is identified as the worst game of all time. I don't believe for a second that E.T. actually is the worst game of all time. There are worse games than E.T. But the thing is, as long as E.T. is identified as the worst game of all time, you know, Yards of Revenge is frequently identified as one of the best games of all time, right? So that means that I have the greatest range of any game designer in history. And I think that's a cool legacy to have, is to have the greatest range, right? The following year was a monumental one for any company developing and manufacturing video games. By 1983, consumers were wanting the next big thing from Atari, and they really didn't have anything lined up. In a rush, Atari did release their 5200 console, and while it was backwards compatible with the games produced for the 2600, it wasn't exactly new, like consumers were expecting. The system itself was really only composed of the same parts from Atari's 400 and 800 model computers. One of the key differences from the 5200 from the 400 and 800 models was the 5200 was equipped with only a 2 kilobit operating system compared to the 10 kilobit operating system provided in the 400 and 800.
while the 5200 did end up selling over a million units, that was just not enough to satisfy the taste consumers had for video games. E.T. is not the reason the industry crashed. E.T. is a symptom of the reason the industry crashed. Manny Gerard, who was the number two guy at Warner Brothers at the time, he's the guy who acquired Atari for Warner. Okay. He was the Warner executive who was most closely associated with Atari. Okay. So what, what he says in the movie, he goes, the idea that E.T. killed the video game industry is just stupid. Right? I'm just quoting it. That's what he said. And I think that's true. What it is, is that uh, the reason the crash occurred was because of the kinds of business practices that were going on at Atari. Atari was a vicious and brutal uh, player in the market. They screwed anybody over they could when they could. And when you do that everywhere you can, what happens is if you start to lose your hold, if you start to lose your grip, everyone who can will jump back on you with both feet, right? So if you burn everybody on the way up, they're all waiting there with the torches and pitchforks when you start coming back down. You know, that's what happened to the video game industry. That's one part of it. There's two big pieces of it. Okay, the first part is that Atari's business practices may set up a situation where as soon as they had any leaks, they were just going to blow up and fall apart. Okay. But the second part is, and this is one of the main things, the reason for the video game crash, the reason the game industry disappeared for a little while is because it was the first product life cycle for a major game console. This was the first time it had ever happened. Which means, you know, there's a guy at Atari, one of the programmers there, who used to say, you know what the definition of state of the art is? State of the art means when it's broke, nobody knows how to fix it, right? Which is a pretty cool concept, right? So uh, the thing is, the first life cycle, the first product life cycle, I mean, there were a lot of mistakes and problems that were made at Atari that no one knew were mistakes yet, right? Because this had never happened before. The idea that you don't have a licensing key so other people can't just make release games on your system without your approval. Atari didn't do that, right? Yeah. The idea of controlling who can release games on your system. The idea that when, you start, when you've got a system going in the market, you should already be developing the next system. There were people at Atari who were saying that, but Atari didn't believe in it. Atari wasn't doing it. Atari was milking a cash cow. You know, Nowadays, when people release a game system, they're already developing the next generation, right? That's always going because they know that this game system is going to be good for a certain number of years, and then it's just going to sort of die out. It's not going to disappear immediately, but it's going to really start falling off. People won't be as interested. They'll have played most of the good games on it, and people are looking for something fresh. And they know that that time period is about how long it takes to design a fresh system. So, so that idea of a product life cycle having an endpoint, they didn't have that concept. At Atari, it was, this was a gold mine we discovered. And here it was, and it's a cash cow, and it's just throwing money at it. And there's nothing you can do to get out of the way. Okay? And this was going to go on forever. And nobody wanted to see it stop or believed it would stop. So they didn't understand the concept of a product life cycle. They didn't see the end coming and prepare for it. So when that happened, there were mad scrambles to try and throw something out into the market to try and keep the ball rolling. But they hadn't really planned and worked towards that, and they paid a big price for that. And no one really had, so the game industry kind of died. And that left the world with the question, you know, because when games were really hot initially, there was the big question of, is this a fad? Or is this a new style of entertainment that's going to go on? You know, people could have said the same thing about radio or television or any of these things when they first come out. You know, and laser discs is a great example of something that, you know, well, it was cool, it was an interesting technology, but it didn't catch on. It was a fad. For a while, a lot of people had laser discs, and then they went away. Right? Yeah. So, the same thing with this. You know, was it a fad? Or was something. Everybody who was involved in the industry 
knew that what we had done is create a new medium. This wasn't a fad. This was a new way to deal with TV in an entertainment fashion. And although Atari went away, games weren't done. You know, the idea of playing video games on a TV, that was not going away. But there are a lot of people who thought it might. And so when there was a lull in the market, there were two kinds of people, right? There were people who go, oh, well, that's it. It was just a fad. It's over. It's another pet rock. Oh, well, what's the next thing? And there are other people who go, wow, Atari really blew it, and they lost track of the market, but this is a huge market, it's a huge industry, and we're going to pick it up and do it. And that's what Nintendo and Sega did, and they jumped in where Atari missed it. To listen to the full hour-long interview with Howard Scott Warshaw, the Silicon Valley therapist, click the link in the description below, or find it on our YouTube channel, One Man Films TN. And be sure to click the link to his website below as well, although... Something tells me his site gets a few thousand more hits than mine. Uh, that is it for this episode of The Bearded Nerd. Thanks for watching. Click the subscribe button if you want to keep up with future videos, and feel free to write hateful comments below. See you next time.